This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Whisper Room, Eventide Audio, Spectra 1964, and Roswell Pro Audio. So get ready to rock. We are in version 1.0 of everything. We are dealing now with people who are who don't even know what immersive sound is, and uh, they're experimenting that for the first time, and it's absolutely obvious that they won't all react the same. Some of them will prefer the stereo version, the same way as we moved from mono to stereo, or people that will like the mono version of the Beatles forever. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac. The speed to create, the capacity to dream. Find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. The Spectra 1964-101 amplifier provides unequaled headroom, low noise, and a linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks. In the studio, this means that critical details from your microphone get through to your DAW. The 101 was used by Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, and The Record Plant on records by ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, and John Lennon. Today, Spectra 1964 brings that same incredible sound to your studio with the STX-100 mic pre. Learn more at Spectra 1964. What do Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Dave Pensato, and George Massenberg all have in common? They all have great things to say about Eventide. Originating in a New York City basement in 1971 with the original Instant Phaser and H910 Harmonizer, Eventide continues to transform the sound of music with the iconic H9000 Harmonizer, visionary guitar effects like the H9 pedal, and now a whole suite of incredible plugins for your studio. Go to eventide.com to learn more or click the link in the show notes below. If you're sick of bothering the neighbors when you are trying to record your music or ruining your recordings with outside noises, but you're not ready to spend a ton of money on permanent studio construction yet, then consider getting a Whisper Room ISO booth for your studio. Whisper Room offers the instant solution for a comfortable, quiet, ventilated, portable ISO booth with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booth when you mention recording studio rock stars. Go to whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. Hey, rock stars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Andres Mayo, a multi Grammy award winning audio engineer and music producer in Buenos Aires, Argentina who has been mastering since 1992 with credits on more than 3,000 albums to date, from vinyl records to 360 audio formats for immersive audio listening. Andres has also received seven Gardell Awards for technical excellence. He's a member of the p e Wing Advisory Council at Neris, and he's owner of Andres Mayo Mastering and Audio Post and at 360 Music Lab, a production company exclusively specialized in immersive audio. Andres is also a competitive tennis player, which is very cool. I just learned that. And I saw Andres speak at the AES conference in New York in 2019 and was really blown away by the Headfo audio examples that he was playing and by hearing these discussions of the possibilities of where music is headed as an immersive experience um, beyond our traditional understanding of originally, you know, a mono speaker and then eventually stereo speakers and surround speakers. So I'm very excited to talk about all these things with Andres. Please welcome Andres Mayo to Recording Studio Rockstars. Andres, are you ready to rock, dude? 
I'm ready to rock. Thanks for inviting me. Man, it's my pleasure. How would I say that um, where you are? How would I say, are you ready to rock down in Buenos Aires? ¿Estás listo para rockear? ¿Estás, be... ¿Estás listo para rockear? Rock, rockear. Okay, cool. ¿Estás listo para rockear? I like yes. it. Love yeah. it. <laughs> Just one quick correction. Uh, uh, it's, I'm not a tennis player. I'm a table tennis player. Oh, I'm so ball. sorry. I said that incorrectly. Thank you for correcting me. Yes, a table tennis player, rock stars. So uh, let me begin with that really quickly. When I was in Hong Kong, for a half a year, my brother was there and he had been playing music and he had started teaching, he was trading um, English lessons for somebody who was was also an incredible table tennis player and was teaching him how to play. Of course, we call it ping pong in the US, but um, I've always had a great deal of respect for for like, you know, top level ping pong or tennis table, uh, table tennis, excuse me. Tell us more about that too. Well, we started like, uh, I would say four or five years ago with my son. He's now 16 years old and uh, we started playing at home, you know, like a, you know, amateur. And uh, it worked really well for us. I mean, we had great fun doing that. And one day we discovered with a friend of us who came to play with us and he absolutely you know, killed us <laughs> that, that uh, we could be much better than we thought. So um, we started exploring, you know, the, the the world of table tennis in a professional way here in Buenos Aires. And we discovered there's a bunch of schools and places where you can play, you can learn, you can, you know, um, talk with your friends your friends or your colleagues and uh, make friends. Actually, actually, that's the best part of that. It's a great community. So we started doing that. We started going to a school on a regular basis on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And we started even playing um, in tournaments and pretty uh, large tournaments on the weekends. So we got pretty good at that. Uh, I would say he's much better than I am. We started in the same uh, category now he's uh, almost two categories over me so wow. he's gre- really great that's awesome. awesome you know it's funny you know you talk about like the community aspect of of table tennis and um uh, ironically it's also a very competitive sport it's one of those ones tennis and table tennis both these one on one sports they can really really make you feel competitive about another person. So it's always cool to hear that interaction. Sometimes I feel like the music world and even making records and studios can feel a little bit like that, um, where it's really a big community, but uh, maybe sometimes when you start out, you feel like it's competitive to try and be able to make records with you know this band or that band. Absolutely. There's a lot in common between ping pong and, uh, and making records, I discovered. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of lonely uh, work or lonely, I mean, something that you do on your own, but at the same time, you're part of a community and uh, you discover yourself doing things that you can share with others and have a lot of fun doing that. And the community is also very friendly. So I find a lot of similarities. Well, the studio that I started out at and cut my teeth at is a place called Alex the Great here in Berry Hill in Nashville. And um, that was one where we always had a ping pong table in the back of the studio. And that was our number one pastime for taking a break from, you know, this the control room stuff is intense. I kind of miss it. I don't know what breaks we take anymore now. But back then, we used to work for a while, and it was like, oh, let's go play a game. You know, we'd go back there and play a game, and and uh, my mentor there, Robin, would inevitably kick my ass, and then we'd go back in and make some more music. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I mean, it's, it's so fun, so fun. It, it, it's, it's, it's great to to have something that you, you can do uh, pretty much anytime. I mean, it's uh, we, I've been playing with my son, you know, at 3 in the morning. Uh, 3 a.m. It's like nice. okay, let's go play a, a match, and uh, you can stop because if you, you play one, then you want to keep going, and maybe you're an hour playing, and it's great to 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 leave everything in in the table. Actually, yeah, leave it in the <laughs> table. I like that. I like that. <laughs> um, well, you know, and it's just a good reminder of of how badly we need anything physical as a break when we're in the studio. Too, because we can, yeah. boy, we can just spend a lot of time sitting in a chair looking at a computer screen. Um, tell us more about how you got started out in all this stuff, Andres. How did you end up, you know, creating immersive audio 
down in Buenos Aires. Is that where you're from? Yeah, I'm from Buenos Aires. Um, basically, it was uh, all connected to the AES, which I presume some of the listeners may know what it's about. It's the Audio Engineering Society. Uh, I became president of the Audio Engineering Society in 2014. And um, I had um, a mission, which was to bring the AES to a new level in terms of um, uh, I mean, making it more modern, if you want. I mean, uh, making it, uh, try to change the way we thought about the uh, the audio industry in general, because we were stuck in always the same kind of uh, subjects. We were doing, you know, um, I don't know, uh, surround sound, mastering, recording. And I, I knew there were just so many things going on that the AS was was simply not addressing. So I put my head mostly on uh, new technologies, and the first one that came to my mind was the audio for virtual and augmented reality. So I was co-chairing in in less than a year. I was co-chairing the first audio for virtual and augmented reality conference in LA, um, and that was a big, big success. It was part of the international conference of the AES, and uh, we had a separate. Um, a separate space where we did three days of intensive, you know, um, listening, um, teaching. A lot of stuff happened there. We had a lot of great sponsors, and that's how I became acquaintance with a lot of um, developers, people from mm-hmm. Korea, from U.S., from Europe, and I developed my own interest in in 360 audio because I knew it was something that was going to be great but I didn't expect it to be so uh, so huge uh, and it's becoming more and more huge uh, with, yeah. with the upcoming uh, years so that was in 2016 and from then to now it's, it's, it didn't stop growing so yeah. I well, there's. Ex- it seems like there's there's uh, and we'll get into this more, but there are just like the platforms f- through which you could experience immersive audio is growing probably yeah. faster than the audio can grow with it at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And I, at the beginning, I was ex- experimenting with uh, Dolby. Dolby turned out to be cl- kind of the first, one of the f- very first pioneers in this, and um, I was better testing for them together mm-hmm. with my colleague Martin Muscatello, who is uh, the, a great mixing engineer that works with me in the studio. <clears throat> and we together uh, built a project called the 360 Music Lab. So that's a research space that we have, mostly for binaural and ambisonic uh, sound. And we developed that through well, the course of you know two or three years now. Um, so we've been experimenting with uh, binaural heads, with ambisonic mics, with uh, standard recordings, which we th- then we turn into 360 mixes using only software tools. And uh, well, over the course of these years, we we made our reputation, and we have been able to show this at the past uh, AES convention in October. Yeah, so we're happy with the results. It was very cool. Um, I remember being introduced to binaural stuff probably in the early 90s. It was probably when I first heard about it. And um, one of the first recordings that I have was had was actually a cassette recording. Uh, it was like a radio um, drama of, um, of the story Mist by Stephen King put out on a cassette. And I remember putting the headphones on, I was blown away with this, you know, the, the fact that you could hear things in different locations. So um, let me uh, let me start with this. Let me, let me ask, um, I hope I'm not catching you off guard here, but but I like to ask guests to share kind of an inspir- inspirational quote um, around making records and, and maybe in this case, immersive audio. Is there anything you want to share with us or, or anybody that has inspired you in immersive audio? Well, in immersive audio, um, I would say that there was not just one inspiration, not just one person. Uh, it's, a, it's a mixture of a lot of people doing amazing stuff all over the world, starting by Michael Gerson uh, back in the 70s in England, when he developed an amazing uh, 
new way of listening and processing audio then called ambisonics. And the main reason why uh, it wasn't so well known is it was because people had no way to listen to it except for a, a huge amount of speakers. And we didn't have the chance to use, you know, regular headphones as we do now with great quality in some cases. And uh, But he was the real pioneer of all this. So, so he was a huge inspiration for all of us. And when you dig into that and you see how brilliant he was at the, in, in the way he created that, it's a very, it's a highly technical uh process i mean that, that he had to come through so uh i mean i understand that the, the 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 difficulties he may have had back in that time must have been huge yeah. but he did it so yeah. that's inspiration and what was some of the um and now i i blanking on the name of it but i remember there was a particular uh mic that had capsules all over it i guess it was the, maybe that was the original ambisonic mic but what were some of the you know feel free to Tell us a little bit more about some of the details of the history, because for many of us, this is going to be brand new, the entire topic. So what were some of the original ambisonic tools, and, and what is ambisonics? Well, ambisonics is, a, a, I would say the definition is a spherical sound, which uh, basically, if you know about MS, mid-side mm -hmm. procedures, it's like a 3D MS. Uh, if you take a mic with um, with three, four different capsules. Three of them would be figure eight, and the other would be um, omnidirectional. Uh, of course, you have to do all the, the, the math to make sure that it is a micrometrical, uh, micrometrically adjusted, sorry. Uh, so you have to make no mistakes in the, in the calculation of that, in the construction of it, because it's absolutely... Um, dependent on the face of the capsules, uh, on the face relationship between the capsules, mm -hmm. but provided that you build uh, pre, I would say, not simple, but uh, the, the, the main idea behind it is it's quite simple, actually, because uh, the, the main problem is how to build it. The, the idea is, okay, you, have, you know what MS is? Okay, put it in three axes and you get it. A 3D space. Uh, then the omnidirectional mic is for one of the the the, the parameters you, that you will get from there. So the the four parameters are W, X, Y, Z, and that then from there, not you get you don't get four channels. You get four parameters, and those parameters, with a lot of calculation, will allow you to process the sound in any way you want to rotate, to zoom in, zoom out, do things that you couldn't do with a regular mic. So it's it's more, um, if you get into the, the real math, it's very complicated, but the main idea is quite simple. It's actually uh, not thinking about um, speakers, but thinking about the difference of pressure between the rear and front, mm -hmm. up and down, and left and right. And, uh, and with that delta, the difference of pressure between one and the other, you calculate everything else. And you can actually build a sphere around your head. And that's what you feel or you hear when you put uh, your headphones and you think, oh, well, how is it possible that I'm hearing so many different locations with just two speakers in wow. my two ears? That's amazing. But it's just uh, 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 an amazing development thinking of the way the, the, the brain hears, or how you interpret what comes through your ears. That's it's, basically the main reason for it. It's so wild. It's so great to hear you talk about it, man. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's really mind blowing stuff. Um, how has some of the, you know, the original, Michael's original ambisonics design changed? to some of the ambisonic microphones we might see today, like the Sennheiser, for example? Well, there's there's not a big difference. The main difference now is that uh, companies like Sennheiser have been able to take it to the next level. I mean, you can actually buy a third order ambisonics, which is way more developed because instead of four channels, you get 16 channels. So you can imagine the precision that comes out of that mic for a reasonable 
price, which would be around 10K. Okay. Uh -huh. Around that price, you get uh, way more precision. You basically go from a 10 degree precision in the 360 sphere to a one degree precision. So you can locate sound objects in any point of the sphere. And even if you can't see them because you may be working without any image to support it, you know exactly where that is because the ambisonics mic will provide that precision. And that's that's a, a real uh, work of art. <laughs> so yeah, really. Sennheiser has been able to provide that to the main to the audience for just about 10k. And that's amazing. So so that would have, would have been completely impossible in the 70s. There was no market for that, mm -hmm. and, and that's the main thing. But the the principles of that are exactly the same as in the 70s. There's no change. That's really wild. So um, it's cool to think about this idea of placing you know, what looks like a single microphone body in a space, but getting an experience where you put on headphones and you could hear and locate any sound that was positioned around that microphone. Is that is that the way to think about it? Do we think about like, you know, if you took a little shaker and you, and you or like some keys or something like that and move them around the mic, you would just hear that in headphones? Or are there some other ways to think about using that mic where you're actually manipulating as if you're turning the mic around on a source and that kind of thing? You can do anything. I mean, you can just plant uh, an ambisonics mic, uh, let's say, in in the center of an orchestra, and you will get every sound source coming to the mic, and you will be able to locate that exactly each one of them in the mix. But you can also tweak that. You can also process that with a lot of uh, close micing techniques that are the, the same techniques that we, we've been using for years. Mm -hmm. So you can put a mic on each instrument, on each voice or whatever you have, <clears throat> and then uh, make it shine or hide it in the mix according to what exactly what you want. You can you know push a, a number of instruments or voices or whatever uh, to, to make them uh, to, to, to put them on top of the rest or to zoom in like I said for example if you're using uh, a complete uh, you're recording a complete uh, drum kit then you can go inside the kick just the kick by zooming in and that's ambisonics power uh, you can I have an experiment which I can give you the the um, the link, if you want, it's a it's a room with three people, and um, you zoom in with the camera to one of the persons who is talking. The three are talking at the same time, reading reading a book, mm -hmm. and you zoom in with the camera to one of them. And with Ambisonics, you can actually hear only what he's saying. Wow! And blur the other two. Okay. When you zoom in with the camera, you can zoom in with the audio as well. That's only ambisonics power. You can do and you cannot do anything like that with any other software or hardware tools. So it's great. Wow, that's really fascinating. So much to learn. It's funny to yeah. to um, have discovered this at the AES conference with you, and then realize that I'm you know in 2020, just about I'm discovering something that's been around since the 1970s. That's one of the things I really yeah. love about uh, music and, and recording audio. It's a very, very deep topic. And, and one more thing, which is, for me, the, the, the greatest um, discovery here. This comes in a, in, a, in a time where we are all experimenting 360 in the most, in the easiest possible way, which is with our cell phones, using you know the GPS and the accelerometer that they, or any smartphone has so you basically turn around with your phone you see an image in 360 even if it's 2d you see it's in 2d but you can change it as, as you point to any 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 point of the sphere and you can hear the sound changing because the sound is being processed in real time according to where the cell phone is is, is pointing and that's the main use of that for the future. Yeah. I mean, y you will be able to experience 360 in image and sound with a $500 uh, piece of equipment. Wow, that's amazing. 
I did a mic shootout for my vocals in the studio and tried 20 different microphones from the Shure SM7 to a vintage Neumann U67, but was impressed that my favorite of all was the Roswell Pro Audio Delphos 2 large diaphragm condenser. Handcrafted in California, Roswell Mics brings you inspired design and attention to detail to help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful microphones, including the Mini K47 for only $349 at Roswell Pro audio.com um so is this something that we should be looking for right now is this something that that is possible right now or is this something that's that's on its way for example if you have an ambisonics mic and a 360 video camera um, maybe talk a little bit about what you would do with those two to create something that was worth watching on a phone well the main thing i'm doing right now are concerts documentaries. I'm doing something that now that you mentioned Stephen King, I'm doing something for HBO uh, in Mexico, which is a st- story, is a short documentary, actually is a teaser of five minutes uh, based on The Outsider, one of the books from Stephen King. And it's completely, it will be projected in a, in a theater, but with no image. So it's completely dark. Um, and everybody will be there with their headphones and will be listening in what they call 4D, which is uh, if you are hearing the rain, then you will get rain in your head. Uh-huh. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> or snow or wind or whatever. But the the, 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 the real feeling of the, of the audio experience is amazing. I mean, you're hearing ambisonics in full potential. So that's one of the ways to experiment uh, 3D audio these days because you can hear it or see it in your phone, but you can see it in or hear it in, in, in a theater as well. So I'm doing concerts, I'm doing documentaries, I'm doing commercials, I'm doing presentations just like this one and by HBO. Um, I don't know, many, many things. Sports as well. That's a, another great thing. Yeah. There are people here like Fox, Fox Sports is uh, starting a new project here in Argentina. Uh, it's called uh, the Virtual Seat where you can uh, hire from Japan or anywhere you may be uh, a seat in in your favorite uh, football stadium. Okay, and you're there because you have a 360 camera with headphones and you are experiencing exactly what you'd be listening to and hearing in that seat. Wow. Okay, you, you pay a virtual seat for, you know, 10 bucks or whatever. Yeah, so imagine a, imagine the virtual helmet cam coming soon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're going to be on the quarterback on the field, hearing and fe- and and seeing. I guess hopefully not feeling because that might be more than people are ready for, but hearing and seeing all the action right on the field. That's really fascinating. I mean, so I mean, of course, one of the things that 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 brings us back to too is, um, you know, ha- whether we're talking about music. So obviously, for recording studio rock stars. We are focused on making great records in the studio, but we're also very fascinated and interested in all the other aspects of audio production that that are out there. And sometimes, you know, all these other aspects of audio production might be where a, a career opportunity is for somebody who's really in, interested in engineering and realizes that maybe it's a challenge to build it, um, recording local bands, you know, that kind of thing. But how do you... What what do you want to say about taking all these things that could be described as an experience, could be described as a special effect, and um, respecting the musical experience as well? Um, I, I I need to understand exactly the the question here. Yeah, I know what? my questions are difficult like that sometimes. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no problem. No, no, no. You spoke at AES about, um, you played an example of something in 360 sound, and then you said, you also made the comment, you know, this is not music, this is sort of a, a special effect, a sound effect. Um, well, maybe, um, yeah. I just wanted to give you a chance to talk about what that means. Yeah, what, I'm, what I mean is that um, uh, sometimes the, the use of technology is uh, becomes more like a, product demo or something like that you know right. it's like it's so flashy and you want to show all you can do with the technology that it doesn't become musical anymore mm-hmm. and uh, I'm against that 
I know that the technology can provide a lot of, you know, great uh, sensations, a lot of great um, new feelings to the audience, but it, it doesn't have to be uh, just that. It has to be part of the, a musical experience if you're talking about music, if it's something different then course but uh talking about music i think that the main thing that it has to be is musical and so i i'm i'm experiencing a lot of uh situations where you know producers want to just to use the technology to, to, to show what they can do with that and it's the same that when we started with the surround sound and people were mixing dvds and blu-rays and i was there i was i was being asked by producers okay let's move the guitars you know, all over the world, all over this the, the surround uh, sound. And it doesn't matter if it's believable or not. It's just an effect. And people will be uh, shouting and, and screaming and clapping all over. And it was like, okay, yeah, maybe I can do that. But uh, is that something that the music needs? Probably not. Yeah. So uh, first, I'm trying to be respectful of what the music is asking for. I'm trying to... Uh, do something that I know the artist will be proud of instead of just taking it to the next level in terms of technology, but to a lower level in terms of music or musicality, if you want. Yeah. Oh, I was going to, uh, I was going to say that that reminds me of things that we've seen in the music business too. So for example, we've, we know of the eighties is the era of, you know, gated reverbs on snares and things like that. Um, sometimes that new effect becomes a special effect and then it becomes used up. Um, uh, chorus effects uh, for guitars and all kinds of things like that. They can be, it can all become a little too much sometimes. And then, of course, auto tune is another example of something yeah. that, you know, showed up and, and then was, um, yeah. you know, maybe questionable to some people. Then it was overused. Then it became iconic and it, yep. and it birthed the whole sound. Absolutely. And, uh, I don't know, but I started in the 90s, the early 90s, where everybody was uh, trying to sound like Studio Dominator 2. No, a piece of gear <laughs> that was, you know, absolutely in every recording, it was like, oh, I know the sound. I mean, it's a little bit too much in the 4K up to, <laughs> to 12K, and you say, well, okay, I don't need that. I don't need that that bright sound in the in the hi hat, which it's totally unnatural, but but I, I know this is for a reason, and the reason is that the producer wants to sound exactly like the other record that the other producer made, or even more if possible. So the same with the loudness war, it's the same with any fashion that we we've been experiencing for thirty or forty years now. So I'm not I, I'm I mean I can't say this is wrong or anything. I'm just saying this is probably non-musical, uh, not for me at least. And I'm trying to use the technology in a way that is serving the purpose of the music, first of all. So in many of the examples you will find in 360, you will find a lot of that. A lot of flashy, you know, turning around and, and doing stuff that just to show that you can do it. Yeah. But what does it make to the music? Well, not much. Probably you will, in the end, you will stick with a very nice stereo mix which is special, it's nice, it has depth, it has, uh, you know, a lot of virtues that are completely lost in the 360. So for a 360 mix to be better than or preferable, uh, or at least to, 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 to make that an option to a, stereo, a good stereo mix, it has to keep some of those virtues and add another one. Yeah, it's almost like being a kid and you can't, you know, you can't stay in your seat at a performance and you're getting up running around and eventually as you mature you learn to just sit in your seat and just focus and listen, you know. Yeah. Sort yeah. of different experience with the ears. And especially here where we have the 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 I would say the honor that we are audio engineers are for the first time guiding the experience because the the ear is the only sense we have that is absolutely 360. Not mm. the, I mean, our eyes can see in, in, in 360, can only see in 120 or 140 degrees. So if there is any, any stimulation, anything going on up above our heads or uh, behind or whatever, we have to turn our, our heads down or, or, or back 
but who's guiding the experience? The ears. Yeah. So we have to be aware that there is no no need for us to keep the the um, the listener pointing their heads in the same direction always as we did in the surround sound times. Now it's everything is coming from ev- everywhere. So that's, that's a big, big chance for us to, to, to place those sound objects anywhere in the space, but to make them believable and to make them uh, real. If you w- we want them to be real, to, to be functional to the experience, not just because uh, it's, it's, you know, we want them to be there and there has to be a reason. So that's that's fascinating, and I'm glad you brought that up. And and you just pointed out something that I hadn't considered before, which is how the ears have this 360 perception that the eyes don't have. Uh, maybe now's the right time to ask this question. Can you explain binaural audio and what that means and why why and how we hear in 360? <laughs> maybe that's a pretty <laughs> big question, but maybe give us the intro version of it uh, to the rock stars now. Yeah, of course. The binaural audio is... Uh, basically, the way we hear, it's um, it's comprised of a large and complex number of factors, which uh, include, for example, all the filtering. The filtering is what we apply unconsciously, our brain applies to anything that comes through our ears, uh, through our tympanic membrane, because uh, the the brain has. The, the, the ability to know if the, the, the sound is coming from behind or from the front just because of a simple uh, difference in the in the frequency response. If it comes from, from behind, the frequency response in the in the range of 3, 4K will be diminished because of the masking of our of the back of our ears, which if, if it comes from from the front, there will be no masking or less masking. Mm-hmm. Uh, the same as if it comes from the right compared to the left, uh, the, the brain will be able to recognize that because it will arrive to the right ear first and then it will round our head and it will take a little, a very short time, which is, sim- is, is, is enough for the brain to discover where it came from because uh, that face difference will be what will be guiding the the brain towards the right and not towards the the left so applying those uh, that huge amount of filtering like if it comes from above it will be um bouncing in our shoulders and that bouncing uh, will yeah. create some different filtering and it will enter the tympanic membrane in a different way so those filters are extremely complex and when you add to that what we call the HRTF, which are the head related transfer function. Oh, that's right. That applies only to your way of percepting, uh, of, of, of hearing. Actually, it's your own uh, hearing system. I would say your own head, your own ears. And for that to happen, you have to adapt those. Um, those uh, the, the the whole set of calculations you will do to your own measures. Mm-hmm. I mean, if your head is is bigger or more dense, it will create a different way of hearing. There will different filtering. Oh, well, I've so got a those, I've got a big dense head, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, th- then you probably hear different than anyone else because <laughs> it's, 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 no, I'm serious. Uh, each one of us have has a different HRTF. So when we use, um, you know, a, a standard set of measures, it will it will apply to you more or less. I would say it will be quite a bit what you will be experiencing. But when you become able, like in two or three years' time, to measure your own ears oh, and man. make HRTF with your cell phone, then everything will sound exactly as you will hear by yourself. Dude, you're flipping that, me out. Hearing you say this, it's like I'm having all these aha moments that I hadn't thought about. It's really amazing. It's amazing. I mean, we're going to that in, in a very, very short time. We are um, crossing that that boundary where absolutely nothing is impossible. And in terms of hearing, you will be hearing the real experience very soon with your simple Cell phone, simple, not so simple, but your inexpensive 
cell phone and yeah. your inexpensive pair of headphones. Yeah, that's so wild. So um, the ears and the shape of our head and our shoulders and our body and just essentially, uh, also rock stars, I should qualify or, or um, um, define when Andres is talking about the tympanic membrane, that's a fancy way of saying when the sound goes in your ear, dudes. <laughs> so, you know, like the sounds come at us and it's funny how we look at things like, you know, one microphone and we think about two speakers and we're like, how do we pan things? Where should we put stuff and everything? But when you start breaking it down to the science a little bit and forget the math for a moment, but when you just think about simple things like a sound is coming towards us, you got two ears, the sound is not going straight into your ears. It's bouncing off things or it's filtering across your head or, you know, basically your head is in the way. That's a way to think of it. It's in the way between the sound and your ear. All this accumulation of information, our brains are so smart, they're way smarter than we think we are, um, that our brains interpret all that information instantaneously and tell us the sound is coming from over there and it's about this big and it sounds like, you know, a male voice or a female voice or an instrument. And the more that the technology begins to understand those things, the more that you can begin to create them in the experience of, of just putting a couple of earbuds in our ears and playing it back. It's really fascinating. Um, let's take a break for just a moment and we'll come back in for the jam session. Rockstars, I want to remind you that we have links in the show notes to stuff we're talking about here with Andres Mayo. And um, we will include some examples somehow. I'm not, I can't say what they are yet because we got to post them still. But we're going to have examples of this 360 audio for you to check out. And I highly recommend you go check it out. It's going to be very, very exciting to hear this. Um, there's a particular track Andres shared with me uh, that just kind of blew me away and gave me tingles on my back, <laughs> on my spine. So we'll see you in just a minute for the jam session. The Spectra 1964 model was created by the missile engineers who are central in rolling out the systems that have protected the free world for over half a century. The extremely stable high circuit design of the 101 amplifier provides unequaled headroom, low noise, and linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks, giving you clearer, punchier, dynamic recordings. During the height of record making, the 101 preamp was the perfect choice to build consoles for Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, Ardent Studios, and New York City record plant, bringing you the sounds of ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, King Crimson, John Lennon, and so many more. The Spectra 1964 legacy is carried on today through Bill Cheney and Jim Romney. Now you can get that same sound in your studio with the STX100 Mic Pre and STX500 EQ. Add the Cinemag Transformer BBDI and the C610 Comp Limiter, and you can have a truly awesome sound. Go to Spectra1964.com to learn more or click the link in the show notes below. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. It was 1971 in a New York City basement when Eventide revolutionized the audio world by introducing the world's first studio effects processor, the Instant Phaser, and the first digital effect, the H910 Harmonizer. Eventide soon followed with the Instant Flanger, Omnipressor, SP2016 Reverb, and H949 and H3000 Harmonizers, which have been favorites of A-list mixers like Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Mick Kozowski, and Dave 
Cansado, and heard on countless hit records over the decades. Today, Eventide brings all that sound to your stage and studio with modern solutions like the H9000 Harmonizer, their complete line of guitar pedals, including the versatile H9 Max, and transformative plugins like Micropitch, Physion, Black Hole, and Mangled Reverb. Take your next mix in your studio to a whole new level. Go to eventide.com or click the link in the show notes below. Are you sick of bothering family and neighbors when you're just trying to rehearse or record your music? Do outside noises or computer fans get into your studio mics and ruin your recordings? You could book a pro studio to record every time, but that would add up quickly, and doing permanent construction to soundproof your studio can easily cost up to $100,000 or more. Trust me, I know. And you can't take that with you when you eventually move the studio. Don't you wish it was an easy solution right now? Quisproom ISO Booths offers a simple way to install a comfortable, quiet, ventilated ISO booth in your studio with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums in a variety of sizes. For 30 years, Whisper Room has been solving studio isolation needs worldwide with ISO booths that are shippable, portable, and can be assembled in an afternoon. Now you can get pro vocal recordings right in your home studio, practice whenever you want, and start using real guitar amps again. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booths when you mention Recording Studio Rockstars at whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Andres Mayo, joining us from Buenos Aires, Argentina. We're talking about creating 360 immersive sound audio that you can experience in headphones and other ways, too. Um, are you ready to, to jam, Andres? I'm absolutely ready. All Thank right, you. all right. So one of the things that I know is important for us to consider is that there's um, much more going on than just making you know music in our studios. Just more than more than just making a rock record with a band. Um, what are some of the opportunities for this immersive sound that we might might not be thinking about already? Well, I think a, a huge field now opening, I mean, it has been open for many years, but it's exploding now, is audio for games. And uh, that's where big, big opportunities are. And uh, I would, I, I want to think of myself as a person who could be alert and uh, exploring new opportunities all the time. I want to, to know or to feel at least that I can do anything that comes up uh, because I'm prepared for that. And for yeah. that to happen, I have to be studying. I have to be up to date. I have to, you know, read. I have to explore. So that's the, my main uh, advice, if you want, for the yeah. audio engineers today. You have to stay fit but, playing table tennis too. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. I don't have to break my my <laughs> my feet like I did. <laughs> oh no, that's yeah, sorry. We don't have to go into that. But I'm sorry. It, it sounded like you got. You were telling me you got a table tennis injury. Bummer. Um. Well, so so audio for games. What what are some things? Uh, if somebody, I mean, I guess if you're young and you're playing games, you probably just have a an understanding that you've grown up with about what it means for audio for games. I'm older. When I started, you know, game audio was just coming out of a little mono speaker on a TV or something like that. Um, what are some of the different aspects of audio for games? that might include immersive sound. Um, I, I imagine that there's like music, there's sound effects, there's other things. How do you want to, how do you want to introduce us to what some of those opportunities are that, to pay attention to? Well, uh, the main thing about audio for games is that everything is possible. And uh, it's a combination of so many skills. Skills uh, You at least have to know how it works. The audio can be, um, of course, in different layers, uh, you have music, you have effects, you have uh, all kinds of stuff going on, um, moving objects. And uh, the, the good thing is that in the gaming world, you can do anything because uh, the, the, there is no video attached. Or I mean, the, 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 the image can be processed in so many ways, way more than regular video because it's animation. Uh, so you can do exactly what you want, which means going from a, from a, let's say from a dark forest to a, 
a wooden cage in a second or a millisecond. Yeah. So you have to, to, to understand how to process that transition to make that believable and how to put the objects in the world, uh, which is your world for a moment, but you can change it to a different world in a second. And that's, that's very, very challenging. So uh, on top of that, you have to know how all those assets are integrated or multiplexed into the same into the same product product for that uh, people using fmod or unity or all kinds of uh, interactive platforms i'm not saying that you have to become a programmer but at least you have to know if you're working in that world that uh, things are integrated you can't just uh, do your audio stuff and deliver and you know don't care about the rest because all, right. all your audio uh, files will be processed and compressed and coded, uh, coded for a, for a, in a platform that you have to know what it's doing with your audio. Same as the streaming platforms. If, if you don't know where your audio is ending, then you will compl- uh, you, know, you will be uh, screaming that your your files are not sounding as you expect yeah. because you didn't know what was happening in the end. Well, well it's uh, a little bit like my one of my recent guests who was talking about doing film composition. Um, you're creating music in that environment and you're you're a, you're a part of a very big group of people that need to come together to collaborate on something and and you know you're describing that in a similar way for the game audio where it's like the, the sounds that you're making are part of a much bigger collaboration through the, um, what did you call them, uh, FMOD and Unity, where, that, where it puts it all together into the final game format? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's exactly that. I mean, it's the same as, as, as composing for a movie. You have to know what else is there, and you have to be very aware that every single bit of your uh, audio composition, uh, your, your music composition, your audio delivery uh, will be post-processed and you have to know what's going to happen with that. So you are able to deliver the best possible format or the best possible uh, quality that will resist all the post-production after that. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's begin with a question about, um, you know, for people who are maybe embarking upon their education and their career options, What's a good place to start for somebody who's curious about making game audio and and music for games? And are those two exclusive things? Are they different? Uh, well, I don't think they're exclusive. Uh, in terms of, of schools, uh, fortunately, there are way more schools than when I started. There was none. Um but in the U.S., at least, uh, there, are, there are very good schools. Uh, I wouldn't, I mean, I can send you, if you like, uh, a, a list of recommended, but I, sure. I don't have off the top of my my my, uh, uh, my head now. But Yeah, yeah. But I mean, but, like, just, just understanding that you can you can literally go to school, you can go to college for this kind of thing now and, and study it and yeah. learn it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's something, that, like I said, 10 years ago we didn't have. And um, of course you can study, but the main thing is that uh, you have to be very keen to uh, learn new stuff and to be uh, able to integrate with a larger group of people who will be expecting from you uh, a, a, you know, 100% delivery of in terms of quality, in terms of uh, time, because you can't miss it. And mm-hmm. in terms of, uh, of formats as well, you can't miss a format. And formats are absolutely crucial here because if you deliver in the wrong format, that makes uh, for everybody a big mess. Because yeah. no one knows except from you what is the right format. And when you deliver something that is not the right thing <laughs> that they're expecting, they don't know what to say. Yeah. Um, what about um, when people are, you know, what, what should people understand about job opportunities in that world? Um, is this the kind of thing where you need to move to a, a movie making hub? Or is this the kind of thing where you can cr- be an audio expert and create content from anywhere in the world and, and lean on the internet for interaction? I would say that hubs are really important so far. I mean, uh, it, it's... Uh, I envision that this will 
be more and more online stuff as it's as it's already happening with music composition or um, mixing or mastering. But for in order for games, uh, it's still a little bit of a wild west. So we don't know exactly uh, who's doing what. Uh, there are no standards. So people are relying on hubs. Uh, to to find jobs and to connect with people, and a great way of doing that is through uh, you know exhibitions or uh, any kind of meetings where people doing the same kind of stuff will meet. Mm-hmm. Uh, AES is a great example of that. There are many, especially in the west coast of the U.S., where you can you know uh, just Google uh, uh, audio for games uh, meetings or or exhibitions, and there are plenty of those. But the thing is, that's a starting point. There, you have to show your abilities and show your experience in that. And it's not easy to to be an experienced uh, audio engineer in in a in a new field because no one has a lot of experience. Right. So m- most of the times, the the big names will take your your opportunities for them. Uh, you just have the opportunity of starting as an assistant, of course, to one of them. But a very, very good way of knowing who's doing what is in those meetings, in those, uh, like I said, exhibitions or whatever, and uh, trying to connect with people, showing your samples, uh, trying to assist in a, in a job, if, even if it's non-paid. But uh, that's what I would suggest for people starting in this new world. Th- what you have to keep in mind is that no one knows exactly where this is going. It's growing so fast that people are, you know, just uh, missing the train every single time. It's like, okay, well, I thought this was going in this way, like virtual reality, two or three years ago. It was going to be huge. Now it's not so huge. It will be huge again, probably when we stop using this uh, awkward and uh, obsolete um, head-mounted displays, which is mm-hmm. which is not something that everybody wants to use. But in uh, maybe in five or ten years' time, we just use regular lenses that will provide us with augmented reality capabilities or neural implants things like that wow. think of your time yeah of course neural right implants yeah you change your reality, reality perception by telling the, your your brain uh, what is the price of that product you're seeing in the supermarket okay but it, it, it you have to change the, the actual reality for that you have to see it see the product and on top of that you will see the price which is augmented reality it's not exactly there but you're seeing it is it okay if i publicly state right now that i'm not going to let somebody stick a neuron and i mean a, an electrode in my head to show me the price of things <laughs> but i know what you're saying i mean i mean that's like very uh, uh minority report too you know this idea of just seeing you know ubiquitous advertising and we already feel that um and that's a different topic. We don't have to go down that road. But it is pretty fascinating thinking about that. And I'm very fascinated by the the thought of augmented reality. In fact, I'm very fascinated by a future of uh, creating music in a studio where we're no longer tethered to a chair um, sitting awkwardly in front of a keyboard and a pair of speakers, yeah. but you can be standing up and moving around. I have a personal vision for how music creation as an engineer could become one of the healthiest things you can do because you're because every move that you make to make music is modeled after a full body movement you know study dancers study yoga study um physical therapy and create yep. a work environment where you're actually doing healthy stuff all day long i would love that myself and i think it yeah. would be great for music as well and I, I feel like as an audio engineer and a, an audio producer, I have the obligation to move the listener around. I mean, I, I, I think that the 360 has to be explored in full. I mean, it, you can't miss it because it, it's just, uh, it would be a, a kind of stupid thing to do to, to have the listener pointing to the front, mm-hmm. if there was a front, <laughs> all the time when things can come from anywhere all the time. You have to move him. You have to, to, to make him experience the full 360 experience. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because, um, and, and maybe now we can, um, well, actually, let's talk about, let me, before we go into 
sort of the uh, the philosophy of what kind of experience you want to create around music. Let's talk a little bit about the tools that might be available to us. So l- let me ask you this question first off. Um, f- if we're not necessarily focused on game audio at the moment, but we're thinking about uh, you know, our love for making music in the studio, and we're like, all right, I want to get involved in immersive audio right now in our studio, in my studio. And this is our listeners are all over the world. Um, what are some suggestions? I mean, you talked about ambisonics microphones, we talked about binaural recording. Um, uh, but you also mentioned the digital tools that let you bring that into the digital world. Talk to us a little bit about what that means. What what are the digital tools that we should be taking a look at for immersive sound? Well, there's plenty of them. Um, any mix can be converted into 360, which is a question I get many times. It's like, oh, I have a, a, a multi-track recording, which I did in a standard way with closed micing and a couple of you know ambient mics. Can I convert that into 360? Yes, you can. And uh, for that to happen, you have to use a software tool, which in most of the cases will be free. That's the good news. Uh, for example, I mentioned earlier that I started uh, beta testing the, um, the Dolby VR suite, which was then discontinued in the in the, in, in the way it was uh, designed originally. Um, then we moved into the Facebook 360 toolkit, which is already available, has been available for two years now, and it's completely free. And uh, now we moved into DRVR, which is a company from Germany that has been acquired by Sennheiser. And since Sennheiser has sponsored our full uh, program, the full 360 Music Lab, then uh, we're using that software tool to create immersive mixing uh, that we convert, as I would say, from standard stereo mixing into 360. Now, um, now, is this the one that I saw as an example at AES where you could put on the VR goggles and you had the controllers and you could point at something and bring it closer exactly. or further and all that? Yeah. That's exactly it. Yes, it's a great tool because I'm not trying to sell it because there are many and almost all of them have great, uh, <laughs> great uh features, but uh, in this case, what you can do is put your um, HMD, your head-mounted display, and with the controllers, you can actually mix without taking your HMD off, which is something that wasn't resolved before, because you had to be mixing with your HMD on, but you couldn't see the keyboard, for example. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit complicated to start mixing with an HMD on. This way, you see what's in the virtual reality or augmented reality, and you can control your own mix with your controllers in your hands. So it's a pretty you know, smart way of mixing. And uh, basically what you get is uh, a, a different way of thinking uh, about the mix. You don't think of... Uh, boxes or you don't think of speakers anymore. You mm-hmm. think about sound objects. Where is this object? The object can be, you know, the voice of the singer, can be the reverb of the singer, can be the guitar, can be the the, the drum kit, or can be a single part of the drum kit, like the kick or the snare or the hi-hat. Mm-hmm. Or it can be a dinosaur where maybe just a single a figure of the single uh, animal will have four or five different objects because uh, the you know the, the 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 mouth will be one sound object then one of the wow the, yeah anything can be a sound and so object. as the animal moves around you're hearing the change of the sound just because the sound objects can move along with the the animated image exactly yeah, yeah. and and uh, when you create more sound objects, the uh, the sound field becomes more complex, of course, but at the same time, it's more believable. So it's uh, you can play with each one of them, giving them, um, you know, a, a different set of features. Like uh, it can be bigger, it can have more, uh, can have more reverb, it can uh, move towards you at a faster speed. 
Uh, so for that to happen, you have to be really aware of how the subject, uh, how the sound object is behaving in that virtual field, uh, and um, it's it's very complicated, but at the same time, it's fascinating. Uh, the the main thing I wanted to point out here is how much uh, computer um, uh, power you need for that. Yeah, because I bet. The, yeah, the, it's processing in real time everything that each sound object is doing and on top of that if you move your head then you're watching the same sound object from a different perspective so it's adding the filtering for your ears because you're not not, not watching in uh, in front of them but um, you know you're turning your head down and uh, the way you will hear is different so it's applying a series of filters on top of the the real processing real-time processing of each sound it's very very complicated yeah so that's the reason why a single computer cannot do sound and image at the same time it's usually two computers hooked up via a network not yeah. yet um, not a, yet anyway not yet of course not yeah not. so when i was at um, middle tennessee state university i took an animation course and we had mm-hmm. an animation lab you know and it was dedicated computers and a huge racks of processors to um, you go in and create a little, you know, with nothing more than clunky boxes moving around, and it, you know, to to render your twenty second, thirty second test clip to just see what it looked like, to see if it even worked. What you tried to do, you know, you'd have to start it and come back tomorrow. Um, oh wow! And now, you know, now with phones and everything, you could you could create animations right on your phone. So I don't see it being too far out before those challenges for for audio will be up to speed with where the video is too. But that's really amazing. And, and I'm, it's very cool to hear you break it down like that and just remind us that we need to, not only are the possibilities different from what we're used to, but we need to think about the right questions to ask differently because yep. things like, you know, the, the different parts of a, in, let's move away from an animal in a movie animation so we don't think about The Lion King for just a second. <laughs> let's think about mm-hmm. the different drums in a drum kit and you're seeing the drummer in a, a virtual space and you walk around the drum kit. You know, those objects might be the different drums in such a way that you hear the drums differently. And that stuff Absolutely. starts to get really fascinating when you think about being at a virtual performance and being able to walk around the performance and the musician's um, so, so what about some, so, uh, Dolby VR suite, I think was one of the first ones, Facebook 360 toolkit. Um, is that something we should still check out and start, start exploring if we want to figure out how to make a 360 audio experience in our studios? And then I guess a quick question is, cause a lot of our listeners are using pro tools and we have very, you know, we're, we're we may have budget studios to start out with. Do we just put on a pair of headphones and can we use these tools with Pro Tools and start experiencing what this stuff can do? Yeah, you will need uh, HD Pro Tools, not uh, the LE version. And um, yeah, of course, you can do it uh, with headphones. It's not, I mean, it's a simple setup, but you have to to be aware of quite a lot of things. So mm-hmm. basically, you have to uh, convert your session into a 360 uh, mixing session, which uh, depending on the uh, on the plugins you use, uh, the, for example, if you use the the Facebook 360 toolkit, then uh, everything is quite explained there. It's kind kind of of easy to use for anyone. Um, of course, if you know what you're doing, but but at least uh, everything is is explained in a way that you won't miss uh, at least uh, the basic things. You'll know that uh, this converts into binaural. Then uh, from there you can get into whatever delivery format you need, and you need such and such uh, many channels. And uh, it's, it's quite uh, there's a, there's a, quite a bit of explanation on what you need right. to, to know. To, to set up your session. Um, then the DOVR is a little bit more complex, but at least the same time, it gives you more capa- uh, capabilities of uh, when it comes to video processing because you can um, you can see your video in what is called equirectangular format, which is like a you know a planet sphere. It's a 2D representation of the full 3D sphere 
and you can track every single object in your video in 2D and that tracking will represent the the the, the position and the movement of each object in your sound sphere and you can right. actually work with all of them in real time. So, so, so let, me, it, let me help clarify that too, Rockstars. What the, what we're describing, what Andres is describing, and I'm uh, really listening to, <laughs> is um, the he, you're just talking about how you can work on a traditional computer screen, but still see what's going on with the 360 video and where the objects would be placed in a 360 audio. In other words, it's like when you take a map of the world and you lay it out. I forget what that's called, where it looks all funny, like... Somebody just cut up a globe and stuck it to a 2D map. Yep. Uh, it's sort of like that, right? It's exactly that. And you're so good at explaining that I'm I'm happy that you understood me and you can explain it to the listeners. Oh, good. I'm glad I'm glad I'm helpful. I'm trying to be. Um, well, so all right. So we've got these different tools. Now, what about Dolby Atmos? I know that's another tool that um, may be available to us too. Do you have anything you want to say about that? Well, Dolby Atmos is of course, a great standard. Uh, it became a standard in the industry. Who can have a doubt about it? Uh, they are so big and so established that um, I would say that the main thing that Dol- Dolby uh, brought to the industry is uh, the, the, the the confidence that uh, you could work in Dolby and 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 be safe. Let's say let's say it this way. Uh, they of course they started with uh, way before the immersive audio was in, in our ears all the time. Mm-hmm. So um, they came from that and they built the Dolby VR suite coming from the uh, the, 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 the speaker-based mixing um, environment, which turned into a headphones-based uh, environment. And that that transition was not so simple because in headphones you have not just um, half hemisphere but also down the equator, okay? Because you can hear things way down, 180 degrees down, which you can't on speakers because your zero degree is is your equator if you want to play it, if you want to see You mean you can hear above and below? Is that that how you're talking about yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, which you can't on speakers. So it adds another dimension or half dimension, if you want, on the yeah. Z axis. And um, but everything was based on speakers, and until we came to the immersive audio uh, way of thinking, and the transition, like I said, was a little bit of a mixture. Uh, they they used a bed concept of uh, speakers, where you could plant a nine one system with uh, the basic mix that you wanted to, to have. And on top of that, all the objects. Uh, this is no longer uh, being used but by by all the, 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 the newer, I would say, platforms like DRVR, which don't think about beds, beds of, uh, of speakers, because mm-hmm. speakers are not uh, applicable here. Right. Uh, although... Yeah. There are many people, like on theaters, on, on many large, uh, large venues, where you need speakers, of course, because you want all people to hear approximately the same. So that's where you come to Atmos, and Atmos is still the standard for speaker uh, environments. So you need Atmos for those transitions, for those representations of the real, real world. But when there is not just you and your spe- and your headphones. There are maybe uh, we did a commercial uh, two years ago for sixty journalists presenting a new car, and we wanted all of them to be listening to the same thing. So we went to Atmos for that. Yeah. Okay. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's a social representation of th- something that you could do on your own headphones, but you wouldn't be able to do that for sixty people. Um, so without getting in too much into the tech, uh, rock stars. I would describe At- Atmos as some really great speakers all around you in the studio. <laughs> you, you, there's, you know, there's sort of left and a right and a center, and then there's ones above, and there's ones directly above, and ones behind you, and ones. I don't remember if Atmos has speakers below you. Does it? Uh, no, below you, no. Like I said, the equator line is on on on, on the floor. I would right. Say. Right. Okay. 
Um, but but uh, it's definitely pretty cool, but it's also pretty expensive and complex to set up, I think, at this point. But um, it's really fascinating to me that you have all these tools because a lot of these tools, um, like uh, we're saying, and I apologize if I'm restating the obvious too much, but as you know, music creators in our studios, we can literally just pop on a pair of headphones and start using them and start building a mix in this 360 space. Um, and you have shared some pretty amazing examples of that with me. I thought maybe if it's all right, I'd ask you a little bit about that. Um, there was one example that I think you just titled 360 Audio Reference, and it sounded kind of like a Bollywood dance mix that that went all around my head. And it was just, it was really amazing sounding um, as an effect for sure, because it sounded like you were playing the music from a speaker and then just walking around my head and above my head and below my head. And the the um, imaging was just really tremendous. I mean, it was really remarkable. So I wanted to ask you if you wanted to talk about how you created such a believable 360 um, experience like that. Well, the first thing I have to say is that that was exactly the example that I gave you before, early in this conversation, where uh, this is more like a product demo. Right. And uh, if, if if you ask me, this is not the more musical way of doing that, mm-hmm. because it's it's like I said, it's it's great to know that you can do that, but I wouldn't apply that for music, just because it's it's. Uh, it's it's a way of showing what you can do, but it's not what exactly what the music needs. So that was done in a way that can impress people, but not necessarily what I would do for a music producer. Right, so, right. And I remember it, you played an example at the AES conference too that you said this is me- this is more of a product demo than you know a musical yeah. expression to me. Um, but nonetheless, the the effect was amazing on me, and it, and it you know, it caused me to have an emotional response, I guess emotional, like, you know, a physical response to where this sound was coming from. And it made me think, wow, this is like having, it's like being introduced to a whole new world of possibilities as far as what you could consider to be an instrument in a musical production. So again, I I would say, um, you know, how do you make a sound come from its you know, sound like it's coming from right behind you, above your head. Um, is it important for that sound to be moving for us to localize it? Um, can a s- static sound, can we just place an instrument in a 360 location and and have certain instruments from behind us and certain instruments in front of us? Um, and do you want to talk about the challenges of making things sound like they're in front of you and behind you? Yeah. Uh, well, <clears throat> for location purposes, it's not necessary that the object is moving. Uh, but it, although it helps, uh, if it moves at least slowly uh, to to have the full perception of the location. Right. But uh, there are locations in the sphere which are more easy to, to attain than others. And uh, that's, that was basically the main reason why Martin Muscatello, my colleague and myself, have been uh, exp- experimenting and changing platforms until we found like the right combination of many different uh, tools, uh, software and hardware, uh, because we wanted to make sure that everything in the sphere was possible. We had some problems locating objects in the rear when it was moving from Top to bottom, mm-hmm. and that was the, the the most complicated part of the of the uh, of the location process. Uh, so then we discovered that using a binaural head, uh, what we call a dummy head, mm-hmm. we actually used the Neumann. Uh, it's a very good one, uh, probably the best one. Uh, we were able to divide the mix when it was already, uh, I would say, planted. I mean, we we divided. The, the the immersive mix we had in stems, and we played some of the stems throughout the the binaural head uh, in a in a surround system that I have in my studio. So we were able to locate, even rotating the the the, the head sometimes, exactly a stem or a, you know a sound object where we wanted. 
like on top or on rear or bottom or whatever it was, because we reamped the sound coming through the speakers and through the the binaural head. Wow! So that's that's a combination of different tools. We did first with software, then we went through hardware using the the um, the binaural head, and at the same time we experimented the same thing with the ambisonics tools. So it's a very complicated process, and it, we had uh, cases where a single mix took us f- more than three weeks because we wanted to experiment. Wow! You know, very fine positioning uh, tools, and and they were not simple to 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 achieve, and we changed. Uh, the procedure many, many times um, until for any single mix. I mean, we had at least, uh, so far we have, uh, I would say, seven or eight in our uh, compilation that we did from scratch. And for for each one of them, we changed the procedure, I would say, five times until we found what we, was really working for each sound object in that particular moment, in that particular location. So it's very complicated. So wow. when you asked me about uh, the procedure, I would say it's a very uh, complex combination of ambisonics, binaural, and software tools. Yeah, and I, and rem- I remember you mentioning my- that at AES, t- saying that it was a combination yeah. of all these things. Yes. So, So it's really amazing. I mean, like thinking about doing this, you guys have gone to great lengths to understand, and I'm going to say it back because I think I'm understanding how you did it. Great lengths to to understand and um, connect the software so that you can you can control how this is being sent to the surround speakers, which are then p- placed in a um, studio, a very controlled environment with a Neumann dummy head in the middle re-recording it in binaural so you're you're able to position it just so in the speakers so that the head re-records it and it sounds right in the final experience in headphones that's exactly right yes Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own records, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is these techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you're using right now. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads for you to practice mixing and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. So now what about for those of us who are like, oh man, this is way beyond my scope. Where should we start out in our studios so that we don't get scared off at this point? I mean, I think that it would be wonderful to include more people learning about how to create a, a 360 sound. Should we just start with the, the simple software tools that you mentioned and you know, maybe we just accept particular limitations in location and things like that? Absolutely, that's the way to go for me. And you don't need to spend a lot of money. We, you just have to have a good computer with a lot of computing power and uh, use any of these software tools, uh, which are free or almost free. And uh, you can get trial versions for, you know, 30 days or so and uh, an experiment. And the, the, way of, the way to go here is um, I'm seeing the object, even if I don't see it, I can imagine exactly where the object is, and if I have any doubts, then probably the location process is not finished, and I have to start all over, or I have to correct something, and I need to show that to many different people with headphones, with the same pair of headphones, uh, until I get exactly the same feeling for all of them. If, because people yeah. are more sensitive, some of them are more sensitive than some others, and uh, many times you will find people saying, "Well, I don't hear the difference. I don't hear it uh, going in circles in my head, and you can hear it perfectly, but you don't have to be driven by what you know. You just have to hear it, 
Yeah. If you hear it, it's okay. If you don't, it's it's not okay. Well, so you remind us that um, again that everybody's head is different. So what might yep. work for you might not work for somebody else. And uh, yep. it does, of course, raise the question. I wonder if we're all dealing with that and just mixing stereo music, and we just didn't realize it up to this point, <laughs> um, because a lot of times we blame it on the speakers. Um, but very, very fascinating to think that the actual experience of hearing is going to be different from everybody. So therefore, yep. you have to really trust what feedback you get from people. If you if you want it to work for everybody, you have to believe them when they tell you it's working or it's not working. Absolutely. And, and, and like I said, I, I think I explained this. Uh, my point of view, at least, in, in, at the AES convention, is we are in version 1.0 of everything. So we are dealing now with people who, are, who don't even know what immersive sound is, and uh, they're experimenting that for the first time. And it's absolutely obvious that they won't all react the same. Some of them will like it, some of them will not. Some of them will prefer the stereo version by far. The same way as when we we moved from mono to stereo, we were people that will like the mono version of the Beatles forever, no matter what, what how good the right. stereo version. Yeah, it was so, gonna. I was gonna ask you a joking question earlier about like. What happens when somebody, when you're mixing the 360 audio for them, they go, hey, is this going to be mono compatible? Do you just kick them out of the studio at that point? <laughs> you're out. Goodbye. Well, but the, but the, the good uh, thing is that they are compatible. I mean, the good thing about Ambisonics is that it's capable of delivering a mix in any format, from mono to 22.2 or whatever, because it's completely adjustable. I mean, it, it, it gives you a series of parameters that don't pay attention to how many speakers you have. It will be the same mix. Of course, you will hear it differently because if it's everything in a single speaker, uh, there are many special things that you won't be able to hear, but you don't need to change the mix because it's completely adjustable. That's one of the great, great things about Ambisonics. That's wild. What was the one that I'm thinking of that has been around for a long time? It's a blue Ambisonics microphone. Uh, Soundfield, was that the one that I remember? Yeah, the, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the... the 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 ah oh, wow <laughs> it's been a minute i haven't even looked at one in a long time but i was always intrigued people would say you could put that over the drums and then you could you know decide more or less cymbals or drums and things like that yeah. too which is pretty like cool like i said yeah that, that's it gives you a, um the ability of processing the audio in a way that you've never experienced before yeah so it's 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 great when you know what to do with that uh, otherwise you can just go with your regular uh, Close micing solution, which will be in the end quite good. Will be eighty percent gets you eighty percent there. So, so rock stars, if I'm hearing you correctly, Andres, um, we can keep recording the way we're recording in the studio. We can start to use tools like um, VR Suite, Facebook 360, uh, DR VR, um, and learn how to take those close mics and turn them into more of an immersive 360 experience by placing things as objects. Um, but then we can also explore uh, binaural recording options. And, um, you know, one one way to do that is to get the Neumann head. I think that's a pretty expensive microphone. I mean, it's an investment. Um, but you can also get, uh, and Andres, do you recommend this? You can also get uh, in-ear microphones that that record binaural. You have to put your head out there, but that's another way to record binaurally, right? Oh yeah, of course, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the other, when I mentioned the dummy head, um, there are ways of doing that that uh, will uh, will be as believable as the the best dummy head. The thing is. Uh, you can create your own binaural recording by using uh, omnidirectional mics, very good quality, electret, or whatever. Um, and, and of course, there are people, students here, building their own uh, dummy heads for a really low cost. Ooh, but, exciting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In the university, I have at least three different students uh, making a project that is, is, is based on binaural recording and with literally, literally no money. <laughs> but the good thing is that by experimenting, you can get anywhere because there is there's still it's still the wild west. No one can tell you exactly how things are done, right? Because there's no standards, and they, that's a very good thing. They can't tell you you're doing it wrong yet. 
Exactly. There's no way to say this is right or wrong because everything is based on the experience. And the mm -hmm. sound experience in 360 is just amazing if you know how to drive your attention to where you want. Yeah. Um, so now the, the the other microphone I didn't finish listing, of course, is Rockstars. You can consider getting an ambisonics mic. And I think that um, Sennheiser and uh, may, I think Rode makes one now too. They're well within the affordable range now to start experimenting with that, right? Yeah, they are both in the range of uh, a little over a thousand k, a thousand a thousand dollars. Yeah, um, and so then my next question to you, Andres, is: Let's say I have an Ambisonics, I have a uh, you know I've created my own dummy head, and I've got close mics in my studio. How can I start thinking about combining those in a recording? Uh, I won't I won't create a you know a surround sound room with a. Um, a dummy head in it to re-record it and reamp it the way you did, but I might just want to get those into my Pro Tools and start mixing it to sound cool. Well, um, I think that everything starts in pre-production. You have to know what you are going to record and doing it, do it in the best possible way. So the, the sound sources will give you what you need in the first place. Um, for example. One big decision is uh, what order of ambisonics am I going to work with? Uh, if you you work with uh, first order of ambisonics, you get 10 degree precision in your 360 sphere. Um, that is is okay for many things. It's not okay for some other things where you need exactly less than one degree precision. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, for a you know a low budget recording, is 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 okay. The main thing is that all of your sound sources will come to the to the mic at pretty much the same level and that's crucial because otherwise you won't get you will get a lot of of um, of uh, delivery problems in your ambisonics channels because they, they will all the capsules will not be be getting the same uh, levels and therefore you won't be able to capture your sound screen, your sound sphere, I would say, uh, completely as you expected. So for that to happen, you have to be very aware of what you're recording and place the mic in exactly the best possible position. So, so when you can I ask you a yeah. question about that? When you talk about sure. the 10 degree or the one degree um, choice, are we talking about a different microphone? Or are we talking about the same microphone and the the uh, version of a plugin that we're going to choose to use to record with. We're talking about a different mic, uh, but of course, a third order ambisonics mic can also record in first order. The thing is, you when you record in first order, you will ask the computer much less computing power, and everything will be much more simple, and you will use less channels and blah blah blah. But you you'll get less precision. So it basically depends on what you want to record. If it's a choir with, let's say, uh, eight voices all around the mic, probably you'll be more than fine with a first order ambisonics. But if it's a more complex setup, then you probably need, or let's say, um, something for gaming where you need exact precision because it will be tied to an image that's it's moving and you, you absolutely need that one degree precision, then you need to to use a third order ambisonics. Okay, so if we're just wanting to sort of make a cool music listening experience um, to start, and maybe it's going to be delivered as a binaural recording, so you don't even turn your head, you just want to hear it, um, you just want to hear the locations, then starting with the first order is going to be a, still a good place to, to, to start and figure yeah. it out. Okay, and then how do you, how, what do you want to think about when you're thinking about mixing that ambisonics mic with the close mics. Uh, I know you talked about it before, but what what other stuff do we want to consider? Uh, you know, now that we're in Pro Tools with this stuff. Well, <clears throat> then you have to use all your musical skills because there is uh, one single thing to consider, and that is what is the music asking for. I mean, let's say that the close miking uh, is. Um, helping you bring the drum kit close to you, but not necessarily close in terms of distance, in terms of uh, relative levels, and in terms of body, uh, then how much more of the uh, kick you will need 
to cover for that body that you need. Uh, is it going to be, you know, 10 dB more? Of course not. It will be probably one dB more or maybe one and a half dB more, but it will be that body that you need in the, in the, in the, in the kick that will ensure that you are hearing the kick uh, from close enough not to miss that body. Uh, and that's uh, when it goes to something that is unreal or unbelievable, it, it, it doesn't make sense. It's just not musical anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question of bringing everything to the front. It's creating the space and using the close micing options to uh, enhance a little bit of those, yeah. a little bit of that. And of course, if you can, you can tie that to the, uh, to the head tracking. When you see the the drum kick, when if this is goes with video and you're moving your head, then the head tracking system will allow you to increase the perception of the drum kit when you're seeing it mm. and lower that when you're not seeing it. Now oh, that's very cool. Okay. You know, it reminds me a little of the first times. Uh, you know, my first pair of mics were a pair of Earthworks TC thirty Ks, which are these Omni ones. You know, with a great frequency response. And I just would take them and I'd tape them up in a club and record my friend's band playing. And I remember loving, generally loving the sound. I mean, it was the sound of the room, but I always thought, you know, I should probably capture the close mics just so that I can make the vocals sound a little bit more, you know, clearer, or you can add just a little bit of detail. And it's that, it sounds like that same thinking. It's like, start with your room mic sounding great, and then just augment it slightly with your, with your close mics, right? Exactly. That's exactly the same concept. And of course, you can increase that in a very good way just by using impulse responses, uh, um, you know, reverbs or any, any kind of processing based on the impulse response of the room you are in, provided that you are doing, a, you know, recording a concert, which happens in the same room. But if you, again, if you're doing audio for games, you will be changing your room in, at any second, because mm -hmm. if you know there's a soldier and moving very fast throughout different embassies, then then you have to be changing that all the time. So it, it, it's probably not practical to do that. But on a on a room where you're recording a an orchestra, that works perfectly. Mm -hmm. I guess you could do an impulse response in your own studio if you wanted to, just to have a little more control over that. Although most of us are trying to figure out how to get a little less room <laughs> in our recordings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have my own set of impulse responses for different things that I want to to emulate, and it works very well, very very well. So that adds a little bit of credibility to the, the mix you're doing. All right, uh, one more question. I know that one of the things you offer is uh, both 360 immersive audio mixing and mastering. What does it mean to master immersive audio? And is do you actually have the ability to begin to create a sense of 3D uh, from a stereo mix, or is it is that the wrong question? No, it's not the wrong question. Um, I, I mean, I started as a mastering engineer in the early 90s. So my main skill at this point is to have a listen to a mix and know if the mix can be better or not, if it was done on purpose or not, if it was, you mm -hmm. know, if, if there were mistakes that prevented the mix to be as good as it can, or not. <laughs> so what I when I'm mastering immersive audio, I'm completely focused on trying to get first the best mix I can. And I'm not mixing if I'm mastering. Uh, normally I would have a, a mixing engineer doing the mix, like when we did this compilation with that we're finishing right now. Uh, it's a 360 music compilation, and uh, I. I I tried not to be present in the mix, but I was supervising the mix. So the mixes came to me, I had listened to them, and the first part of my mastering process was to be able to say, this mix is okay, this mix needs tweaking here, here, here. I am hearing notches in this and this frequency, and I'm hearing that the um, movement of this object is simply not believable, or the location of this object is not believable. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of... Uh, pre-filtering I'm doing before mastering. And then the, the rest of the, of the mastering process is a quite complicated one because most of the times, I would say for 25 years or more, I've been mastering with speakers. I have my ATCs, which I trust more than anything else. 
And uh, on in, in immersive audio, you can't just rely on speakers. You can you have to be working with headphones. So mastering with headphones is a completely new world because uh, loudness relationships between the different tracks are not as simple to, to judge with headphones because right. you don't have the same feeling as you have with the speakers. So that's the main, main challenge I've been having. Yeah, interesting. So yeah, I, I imagine you spend a lot of time in headphones do you also spend a lot of time working with your eyes closed? Uh, yes. When I'm mastering, I, I work with eyes closed uh, many, many times because I compare A, B, and I don't want to know uh, which is which. I want to judge just by my ears. And that's what I suggest that every audio engineer does every single day, to judge by the ears and not by any visual stimulus. That's wild. Well, um, this has been so educational and really exciting. It's so deep that I feel like I've only, we've barely scratched the surface on stuff, but we really appreciate you doing this with us. Let me jump into some of the kind of typical outro questions and, um, and then we'll, we'll roll out, uh, finish out on the podcast here, if that sounds good to you. Yeah, sounds perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. So Andres, when you started out, um, maybe, maybe we'll focus this on, immersive audio, but when you started out in creating immersive audio and recording, what do you feel like was holding you back? Uh, um, well, I think that uh, the main the main drawback I found at the beginning was the, the fast obsolescence of the technology. So I didn't want to start until I was certain that this was going somewhere at least right so um, i found the right spot to do that when i discovered uh, maybe by accident that people were all using uh, at least 90 percent of the people of the, the the consuming market were using the same pair of headphones or almost the same pair of headphones yeah you know earbuds and stuff that usually uh, were not easy to get uh, 10 or 15 years ago but now they're just you know uh, 50 bucks or 100 bucks and they were basically having a great uh, great sounding quality from there I mean yeah. not as good as you could expect in the future but pretty good yeah. so then I, I said okay that's the starting point people are able to hear everything in the same environment just by using 50 bucks headphones and that that's that's a very good news for people who are doing immersive sound yeah. because you can deliver uh, stereo files which are binaural to anywhere using WhatsApp or any platform or Spotify or YouTube and they will all be listening to the same thing. So yeah. before that, that was impossible. Now it's absolutely possible. Okay, very cool. Um, and so you know that that was sort of holding you back. But then when that became possible, then that. You felt like now is the time to start focusing on on creating immersive audio. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Now, um, how about some of the best re best advice you remember receiving? Um, was there anybody that sort of inspired you around? Uh, you mentioned Michael Gerson in the beginning, but have you? Do you remember getting some great advice in terms of immersive audio in three hundred and sixty? Oh, uh, in terms of immersive audio, I don't think I've received great advices because. Um, to be honest, I think I've been uh, together with a bunch of people uh, trying to pioneer this, uh, and, and 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 I see myself as one as a person who has been, uh, you know, opening uh, a new path uh, in the jungle, yeah. like <laughs> many of those people out there are. But uh, you are in South America, are, after all. Absolutely, yeah, and I'm I'm proud of that. But uh, for the same reason, I had no one to ask. Uh, the the one person that has always guided me, because even though he's been around for many many years now, he's always a pioneer and a bright mind. Is Bob Ludwig? Yeah. Uh, he's uh, he's a uh, is although he's recognized as a brilliant mastering engineer. The the one thing that I admire from him. Most of the times is that he's always on top of, of the game. You know, he's always thinking ahead. Mm -hmm. He's always, uh, you know, um, an early adopter. And that inspired me more, more than his uh, 
mastering skills, which are amazing. Because he taught me that an audio engineer has to be someone thinking ahead of, ahead of a game all the time. Yeah. And he did that for the first time when he quit MasterDisc in the 90s and went to move up in Maine, mm -hmm. uh, Portland, Maine. And everybody was saying, oh, how is this guy, guy going to, you know, to, to be able to work if he's not in New York? And he proved that that was not necessary anymore because he saw internet way before the rest of the people. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, he really did. He moved up there in the 90s and, and we yeah. couldn't even rely on that really quite yet, but he saw it coming. You know, I, I do have a little Bob Ludwig anecdote. Um, it was a great story. I had worked with a particular label here and um, the label owner had a band and, you know, they sent the mixes up to Bob to be mastered. And um, it came back and it didn't sound right to him. And he said, he said, how come, you know, I've got this jam box in the, in the office here and how come I can play the mixes off the cassette or the CD here and just press the rock button and it sounds so good. But the, I want the masters to sound exciting like that. And he was trying to explain that to Bob. And Bob said, well, just why don't you just put the jam box, just box it up and ship it up to me. And we'll take a look at it. So, so they <laughs> shipped the jam box up to to uh, uh, is it Gateway Mastering? Is that Bob's studio? Yeah, yeah. Gateway. Shipped it up to Gateway, and then Bob put it on the testing rack, and they test the frequency response of what was coming out of the speakers of the jam box, and they created a new approach to mastering the record, and it came back, and everybody loved it. So, it was, I like that. It's like don't be afraid to. Uh, to think outside the box. And I, you know, that reminds me of the advice you were saying earlier, um, which was just simply reminding us that what we hear is not always what everybody else hears. And maybe some of the best advice we get is from all the people who don't give a shit about all the tools that we just use to create that music, but they just listen to it and they say either, I love it and I hear it, or I don't hear it and you're not done yet. And that's, that's probably good advice for all of us. Yeah, I mean, and, and don't rely on visual uh, stimulation like, you know, all those meters. I have a, a client, uh, where I do mastering most of the times, and uh, I, I have a client from, I don't know where he's from, but he's always talking to me about meters, and I'm correcting his mixes all over and over, and, and, and he keeps saying, oh yeah, of course, the meter is saying that, the meter, I mean, Try to focus on what your ears are saying, not yeah. your meters. Saying. You know, when was the last time a meter bought your record? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you for humoring, humoring me on that one. All right. So now here's another question for you, Andres. Um, can you share a, a recording tip, hack, or secret sauce, um, maybe about doing you know, 360 sound that the rock stars could check out on their next session? Yeah, uh, I have a general one, and uh, I hope it's appropriate. The the one thing I do every single day in my room is um, to do blind listening, to train my ears, and that's that has to be in the best possible condition because uh, blind listening is a very hard thing to do, and you can be fooled by your uh, brain or your ears very easily. Mm -hmm. So to train my ears is the most important thing I do every single day in my room, and I have been doing that, that for almost 30 years. So that's a general general advice. It, when it comes to um, 360 mixing, I would say that probably the main thing I have to, to say, or if you want, it could be an advice, is um, we're not done yet. I mean, no one can tell you what is right or wrong. We spoke about this uh, a few minutes ago, but I want to reinforce that idea that that uh, don't be afraid to experiment because uh, nothing is said yet. I mean, it, we're trying to get the best possible product out there and no one even knows exactly um, how this is going to look like, how this is going to sound like, and you are on top of the game if you're experimenting with it because you can get farther than anyone else just by trying. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's a bit of a combination of skills and a bit of a combination of uh, tools. But uh, as much as you get to learn from, uh, you know, from, from what is already done uh, from your own instinct, it will get you uh, 
farther than the rest. And, uh, and I've been able to try that by myself. What is a way that the rock stars could try doing some blind listening in their studio? Well, the first thing is that to your your monitoring system very well calibrated and to check it uh, on a consistent basis. And you have to know uh, that, for example, in Pro Tools, people who are using Pro Tools, there's a very simple way of doing this. I I have uh, my mastering chain going through a series of uh, inputs and outputs to, because I work mostly analog or digital, but with outboard. So I, in the end of, of the mastering chain, I come to a, a track where I record my master. In that same track, I have my mix, which is already planted there. I mean, so with a single command, which in Pro Tools would be option K, is monitoring in, monitor in, monitor out. I can hear what was there before, which is the original mix, and what is coming through the mastering chain, which mm. will be uh, the, the, with a little bit of a process. Of course, the process does not have to include uh, a, a volume change because the volume change will fool you completely. But if you are able to listen to one or the other, just by changing option K or monitor in, monitor out, then you just close your eyes <laughs> and you change the key until you know you don't know, sorry, if you're hearing the mix or the mastered mix. And and that will take you to the right decision. Uh, are you hearing the difference? Yes or not. Uh, are you liking the difference? Yes or not. That's a very simple way of training your ears. Yeah. You, you can't be fooled by yourself. You just have to uh, make a decision and, and see, okay, yes, I'm hearing the difference. Then you open your eyes. And if the difference is what you expected, is because you're hearing correctly. Otherwise, you have to keep training. Yeah, so so if I understand you correctly, you're flipping through input using option K, uh, or is it option yep. K? Yeah, option K on a Mac yep. uh, uh, in Pro Tools, and you're, you're flipping between input or playing back what's on the track enough times quickly with your eyes closed so you don't know which one it is anymore. And then with your eyes closed, you continue doing that until you decide which one you like better. And then you open your eyes yes. and you look to see which one you chose. Exactly. I do that for every single job, every single day in my room. And I've wild. been doing this for almost 30 years. So there's absolutely no, if I'm on a good day, there's no way to fool me with a meter or anything else. I just hear uh, the difference A, B, and I know where I'm, 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 where I'm at because my ears tell me. I mean, it's not, it's not magic. It's not that I'm uh, superior to anyone. I've just, I've just been self-trained for 30 years. Yeah. Well, I know there's another tool that I discovered a long time ago called uh, Nugent AB Assist, which was a free plugin, yep. I think. And I don't know if it's still out there or not, but it allowed you to set set up kind of a an AB comparison in Pro Tools. And then you just hit the AB button and it doesn't tell you which. It's random. So you don't know which one yep. you're listening to. And then in the end, yep. you show the results and it tells you which one you like the best, which is pretty pretty fun. Um, yeah, okay, many ways of doing it, but you don't need to spend a coin on that. Yeah. All right. So let's see. Um, what else do I want to ask you about? Um, let's ask you for for a business tip um, for the for the rock stars that may not want to do this just as a hobby, but they may want to make a living at making music, and um, you know, particularly maybe uh, exploring the the possibilities of immersive sound and and three sixty and and all that's out there. Do you have any more tips you want to share for them about um, what they might be wanting to think about? Well, from a business point of view, I think this is a, a, a very exciting moment because um, the good thing is that the talent is completely exportable. I mean, you can be working like a, I'm working in Argentina for people from all over the world. I would say over 90% of my work is from outside Latin America. So uh, that means that there are no no barriers, no 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 frontiers. Uh, it's a new democracy, if you want, and you just have to show your talent. So um, the, the the business opportunities are in immersive sound. What I'm envisioning are mostly in the uh, documentary, sports, or uh, music and gaming um, fields. I there might be others, but those are the four more. Um, 
more common, and the, uh, of course, uh, commercials as well. Commercials are exploding because the the um, the agencies are trying to show the clients what new they have. Okay, mm-hmm. what is the new technology? How they can impress? But the bad thing about is about it is that. Most of the clients are not ready to to see the difference or hear the difference. So in many cases, they have to come up with a solution that is really impressive, like what I mentioned before about the H- HBO presentation mm-hmm. in a theater where they're experiencing 3D sound uh, in the best possible way, and they make sure that everybody hears the same, and the 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 you know the the audio perception is also filled with a 4D. Um, simulation, you know, so, so you get wind and snow and whatever. Yeah. So that's 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 a way of doing that. But like I said, in the other experience we had uh, three two two years ago, with the the presentation of this new car, uh, we had these sixty journalists in a kind of uh, dome, in a beautiful dome, uh, and which was like a planetary, and people were sitting in ergonomic ergonomical chairs. Uh, pointing to the ceiling, and we had a 360 camera that uh, was uh, projecting. I mean, a series of of projectors uh, pointing to the to the dome, um, showing the contents of the inside of a car, where we recorded with a 360 camera inside the car, and the car had a um, transparent ceiling. Of transparent mm-hmm. uh, roof. Mm-hmm. So we shot images of uh, an alpinist coming through the top of the of the car, and you had the impression that the the alpinist was coming to your head, basically. And the sound was, you know, accompanying that in the best possible way. So you have to be creative, and you have to be able to deliver uh, those formats and those uh, new products to impress. The, the audience in a new way yeah. and 360 is here for that so basically the, the main uh, advice if there is any advice that you, I can possibly make is be alert for new businesses that are being developed as we speak in, in, in immersive because everything is about experience yeah so well, well it just reminds us that it's it's fun what you're suggesting because it means we can begin by doing nothing more than an exploration we can just simply start googling immersive 360 look for stuff to listen to so we can begin to understand what the experience is and then um, we'll find opportunities uh, f- hopefully for you know where we can go create in that that particular thing. Um, yeah, and join the forums. Join the forums in Facebook, on YouTube. There are a lot of forums on 360 and communities on 360 that will give you a lot of tips of what you can be doing because people are out there doing it. Yeah, and go follow at Music uh, 360 Music Lab, which is your channel, right? Oh, thank you. Yeah, on Instagram. On Instagram, yeah, very cool. So, so that would um, what would we expect to find there? Are you actually able to share? Any 360 audio on Instagram as well, or is it is it more for um, you know photos and videos of what you guys are up to? Well, we will be posting the entire compilation when we have it ready, which will happen in a month or so. Oh, so it'll be that'll be synced right up with this uh, podcast episode coming out. So that's great. Um, all right, Andres. Uh, again, I appreciate you so much being here with us. I have one final closing question for you. Um, we're gonna. Yeah. This is hypothetical. We're gonna take the way back studio machine, and you're gonna go back in time and find young Andres, uh, maybe just still trying to learn how to hold your table tennis paddle, and <laughs> and you say, "Listen, dude, uh, I, I'm not here to kick your ass in table tennis, but I am here to give you some advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to become a rock star of the recording studio, and particularly in 360 audio. One day, what advice would you like to go back and give yourself if you could? Well, uh, the one thing I I always uh, regretted because I thought that I could have discovered that way before, and I know there are a lot of people in the same uh, limbo, limbo or in the same cloud, yeah, this very same time, is discover what kind of mind you have. Okay, mm. that's very, very, very important. I discovered I wanted to be an audio engineer, and more than anything a mastering engineer 
And then it became the 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 you know the pioneering thing and the 360 and the innovation that because that's the kind of mind I have. I I, I I'm absolutely obsessed about uh, perfection, and uh, therefore, and I'm not very good at uh, instant decisions. So there, I couldn't have been a very good live sound engineer, for example, because I'm not that 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 quick. I need my time to think, and I'm the other. I have the other part of the, of of my brain very active, which is you know very obsessed about perfection and trying to do the best I can, but I need time for that. So that drove me to a decision that in the end was very simple to make. I'm very, much better at correcting things that other people made before that are doing things from scratch. Mm-hmm. you know, and I discovered that from my own. Uh, joy and for my own profession, and then I became, uh, I think I, I became a fine um, mastering engineer and lately um, uh, uh, 360 mixing engineer because uh, on top of that I wanted to discover new things all the time. So think about yourself, think about who you are and what kind of mind you have, and that will take you uh, further away because it's uh, when you, you put your passion in what you're good at, nothing can beat you. That's great. Great advice. And and I remember that being one of the challenges for me too, is uh, it's very easy to be distracted and see what other people are doing and think, oh, maybe I should be doing that instead of yep. really looking yep. inside yourself and, and just saying, you know what, what I really like is doing this and therefore my best work will be doing the thing I really like and I should just Absolutely. pursue that, you know? Absolutely. That's, that's my base, best advice because I discovered that when I was 25 years old. And I could I could have discovered that way before, but I never paid attention to a single thing. And that thing, single thing, was that the only part of the, the the newspaper that I really liked was the 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 one that spoke about music. Nice, <laughs> nice. Well, for me too. I was in architecture school, uh, but it was playing in rock bands that was the thing I really liked. I just didn't take it seriously. I thought it was just fun. I didn't realize that fun can be serious. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so, Andres, again, thank you so much for taking out this uh, your precious time from the studio to be with us on Recording Studio Rockstars. We're incredibly grateful to have you here. Um, and we want to know how can we find you online? Where should the Rockstars go to learn more about you and to follow you? And uh, how do they reach out to you for their next brilliant 360 music production? Well, first of all, thank you so much. You're an incredible host, and uh, I, I had a great time. I can't believe that this time passed so fast. Uh, people who want to know more about what I'm doing and what the the 360 developments are, uh, how how we're moving with that, can follow us on Instagram at 360 Music Lab, or my own uh, account, which is Andres Majo, Andre Mayo, if you like, Estudio, which is in Spanish. So it's not studio, but a studio. Um, and basically, um, I have, um, I have, I'm posting constantly on Twitter uh, my own name, and also on Facebook. So I'm pretty easy to find, uh, and, and I'm also keen to to reply to anyone who have any kind of questions or comments about that. Fantastic. Well, rock stars, we will of course include links directly to Andres in the show notes. So just. Scroll through on your phone, go look for it, um, go to the blog post, and you'll see a link to, to all these different platforms there. And Andres, what a pleasure hanging out with you. Um, a reminder to us, let's make sure we include links to some of the 360 audio examples so that everybody can check them out because um, we're all going to be dying to hear it. And I highly, highly recommend you go listen to this stuff, Rockstars. It's, it's a real experience. It's way beyond two speakers. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. And uh, it will definitely be posted uh, as, as soon as we finish it by probably the beginning of 2020. I, I would say January It will should be online. Well, that's awesome. Because so so this podcast will come out in February. So perfect. <laughs> it's already out. There Excellent. you have it, Roxanne. Awesome. Excellent. Thanks so much, Andres. Um, look forward to seeing you in person again. Uh, hopefully at the next AES event or NAM or wherever you are. And um, what a pleasure hanging out with you. Thank you so much again for your kindness. All right. Talk soon. Cheers. Talk soon. Bye-bye. 
Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio. Just look for the link in the show notes below. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Thanks so much for listening to this episode, Rockstars. I also want to give a big thank you to our sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Whisper Room, Eventide Audio, Spectra 1964, and Roswell Pro Audio. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things that I highly recommend you check out for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Cheers.